Undertale by Toby Fox. A fatal error has occurred. The main comic for the aftermath of a fight between two glitches, Error Sands and Geno Sands. Error being known as a multiversal destroyer and Geno being known from an alternate timeline comic of Undertale known as Aftertale. This comic is by Lover of Piggies on Tumblr or by their better known name of Crayon Queen. Now, here is the possibly confusing part and what the Undertale community is known for. Timelines, alternate universes, voids, etc. We like to have everything connected into one massive system, either through canons, versions, takes, timelines, alternate universes, what ifs, etc. All connecting into a multiverse, or like the internet is inside of a computer, because all three of these sanses are technically the same sans just from different times and timelines. They all originate from Aftertale, but Fatal Error comes to be after the fight between Error going back to Aftertale to destroy it. And well, failing. But to understand any of this, we need to understand how all three of these big community characters came to be. Off to Aftertale by Crayon Queen, we go. Aftertale, an alternate timeline comic of Undertale by Lover of Piggies on Tumblr, better known as Crayon Queen. The name Crayon Queen could be a knock at their use of using crayons to color in their comics. This is seen right at the start of the comic. The first page showing the death of Sans in the corridor, and the next showing him wake up in absolute panic. This marks a new day, waking up Papyrus and them chalking it up to just another nightmare. After having a nightmare of finding your dead brother and it feeling so real, he just says, nah, it wasn't that bad. I would love to know his top five. With Papyrus going to bed with boxers on his head as a head cap. The day now goes on as a normal day in Undertale. They go on walking to their stations and Papyrus telling Sans not to slack off, like that's not gonna happen anyway. A good old whoopee cushion handshake with a side of a nightmare flash. Now I will say it, the talent is crazy. People have a hard time seeing this and think it doesn't take work, time, and or talent. Trust me, not everyone has it in what they want, or any at all. Risk is taken to the shed to be away from the cold, but there is no way this is much better than outside. It's a shed. We all know sheds, more often than not, are just plywood or metal. Oh yeah, a blanket and some hot cocoa, and that's it. No shot this is much better than outside. Oh, you can't forget about the dog food, though. Why do they have dog food? This panel marks the start to a dream of a memory from a previous timeline. Undyne and Alphys are talking through what they both will be doing next as they are watching Frisk kill everything in its way. Undyne notices that Sans looks like he's about to roll into a ball forever, so she goes to talk with him before having her legendary fight, trying to help him not lose hope for the future. But Sans stiff arms her, looking like he's just about to crash out but my expectations were broken after I saw the next frame of Sans just chilling. Added a pun and a smile to the bold lie of him acting like he's just fine. Utter disbelief. The memory continues with Sans going to the camera feed and watching. Like bro, I know his magic must be boiling, but this isn't going to make it much better. Then he asks for the cameras for Snowden. Why would he want to watch his own brother's death happen? This forces Sans to wake up from such a terror, very understandably panicking. Sans only comes down from this intense outburst of emotions and magic after seeing Papyrus come to comfort him. Magic so intense, it burned the back of his clothes to the bone. As the emotions calm and everyone gets ready to go back to bed, Things seem to be back to normal. For Papyrus and Frisk, that is. Morning hits, 
and everyone leaves the house, giving Papyrus a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one with Sans, talking about his recent nightmares and how he seems to hide things from him. Sans explains how he felt himself die, turn into dust. Some people know what this feels like. It must be unimaginable. On top of that, knowing the people you care of most could die, are dead, or will be dead, must be the worst, nothing is in my control feeling. But Papyrus, being the number one brother ever in all of fiction, he helped him out in the best way possible, just showing how much he loves him as a brother, wearing him being his brother like an honor, a badge, a medal, a trophy. The love is so genuine. Then Sans falls asleep because of no sleep from last chapter. After a good old nap, Sans goes to Frisk and Waterfall for the Grillby scene, of course. Sans being the little celebrity he is, a pun here and there, chillin'. We get an art style change after Sans asks some questions. It truly conveys the heavy tone of this scene. Be honest with me, kid. I won't judge. Have we met before? And if that's the case, did you hurt them? My friends? My family? Me? Did you kill us all, Frisk? Frisk seems to verbally respond to these questions, which surprised Sans, since Frisk is mostly untalkative, at least verbally like this. Frisk drops a bombshell, saying with wide eyes and an ear-to-ear -ear smile, You remember when I killed everyone, Sans? In the words of Crayon Queen, Welcome to the true beginning of Aftertale, everyone. As Frisk starts talking proudly about this situation, smiling and laughing, Grilby notices this and asks everyone out of the restaurant. Sans makes a split decision to give Frisk a treat for such information. Two blasters to the face. If it works, it works. As the world gets reset, Sans is teleported to the save screen, seeing two figures walking towards him. As they walk into the light, it seems to be glitched versions of Frisk and Sans. A new scene begins with more puns than Frisk can handle. After a cute little scene of Frisk playing with gaster blasters, it is brought to Sans's attention that the kid he is dealing with is Chara, and the kid that is here in the save screen is the real Frisk. And the nightmares that Sans has been experiencing was this dead Sans's fault that neither of them were supposed to exist like this. It was this Sans that watched the video of Papyrus being killed by the human. Sans wanted to make sure that the human really meant to kill Papyrus, but he was trying to deny the obvious, and he watched his own brother dust away. He decided to take matters into his own hands after watching Undyne die. He knew doing anything was pointless, seeing the reports of timelines start and end, stopping and starting again. He knew whatever he did, the timeline would be reset and everyone would forget almost everything but bits of the past. This Sans stated that if he let this continue, a week into the next timeline, it would end all other timelines forever, and the anomaly had to be the cause of this. When this Sands was in the world, he had nothing else to lose after learning all of this. So why not do something risky? Using the determination that was in the True Lab to fight against this powerful enemy. Determination is one hell of a drug. He was desperate, wanted to just kill the kid once, hoping to have enough determination to overpower the kid's determination. Enough to stop the resets and suffering for good. The kid died, sending him to the save screen. He thought he succeeded, but it didn't work out as planned. It looked like the world was resetting, so Sans needs to go back into the world, cutting the explanation short. 
Glitched Sands says he will try to speak to Sands right from his dreams. And there is one thing he needs to remember. That Chara has possession of Frisk's body. And that the timeline was altered by killing Chara. Chara is now going to focus themselves on Sands. The playing field has changed because Chara now has a new interest in the world. If Sans fails to keep Chara interested in causing more suffering, all existence will end for everyone. It suffer by the hands of Chara, or everyone stops existing. Before Sans goes back into the world, Glitched Sans thanks him for being good to Papyrus. Before snapping Sans back into the world. Sans pops back into the world, bouncing from the couch to the floor. They go get some rest, and a brand new day begins. Lowey talks to Sans about the situation he is in. He mentions that Chara will have Sans go through hell for approaching Chara about the resets. Flowey is only helping so he can keep existing. The ruins door opens. And Chara and Toriel are the ones that come from behind the door. Toriel and Sans quickly find out that they know each other from their pun sessions. So this lightens the darkening mood for Sans. Chara seems to have convinced Toriel to escort Chara all the way to Asgore so she doesn't need to face him alone. Papyrus pops into the mix saying he had forgot to mention something. But Toriel realizes that Papyrus is Sans's brother quickly. After a trip to the house, some more puns, they arrive at Grillby's. A spear crashes through a window looking out of the diner. Undyne seems to have ran into the pair at the diner, wanting to take the human soul, the last one monsters need to be free. The former queen is not going to allow this child to die on her watch. Undyne says that the human she is protecting is the seventh human to fall, that they are not, that they are in fact the eighth because Chara existed and shouldn't be discounted. I would be shook too. Toriel states that if Asgore wants this child's soul, he'll have to come get them himself. Undyne decides to not argue with Toriel and leaves to get Asgore. But Papyrus stops her from leaving with a friendly competition. Papyrus tells Sans to pick up a boulder, like that's gonna happen. Papyrus then tells Undyne to pick up the boulder. She happily accepts. But Toriel, being a boss monster, can one-handedly pick the boulder up with ease. When everyone gets distracted from that, Sans pulls Undyne aside, asking for a favor from her to not let the human out of their sight. Undyne accepts this favor, and now we have Undyne keeping sight on Chara at all times. Sans leaves so he can take a quick nap, just so Sans can talk to Glitched Sans for more information. Glitched Sands explains that he thought he could manipulate time, like using saves and resets. But when he tried, nothing happened. Then Frisk loaded the last save point, the fight in the Judgment Hall. His determination allowed him to remember each time the human reloaded their save. As time goes on, he noticed that the human was predicting his movements, his attacks, his everything. With each save loaded, the human survived longer and Sans grew more tired. After the human failed 536 times, Frisk finally hit their goal. As Sans was half dust, he snapped his fingers and left time completely inside of the save screen. Glitched Sans shows the ninth of his soul that survived and his body full of holes. It is then revealed that both Sans's don't have a full soul, and what Glitched Sands prefers to be named, Gino Sands. He states it's the name he deserves, not a name he wears proudly, a name of shame. Sands wraps up his talk with Gino Sands and talks to Glitched Frisk. Frisk tells their story to Sands, saying that Chara is the first person they spoke to. At the end, Frisk learned that they had the power to reset, 
They went ahead and used this power so much that both Chara and Frisk got bored. Chara then suggested to start killing, and Frisk accepted. As they continued resetting, Chara's influence got stronger and darker. After many timelines, Frisk finally finished the game, and when that happened, Chara took Frisk's body as their own, ended up on the save screen, meeting Geno Sans. Frisk knew immediately it was the first Sans they killed. Frisk says they are tired of hiding behind their guilt, and that is why the glitch they had finally disappeared. Sans with his empty skull comes up with a plan to fix all of this, getting Chara into the save screen. Frisk tells Sans not to go with that plan, because that is what Gino wants, and his plan isn't going to end how they want it to. Gino Sans sees something in the world and panics, sending Sans back into the world because it has something to do with Papyrus. After Frisk is honest with Gino and tells him that they told Sans enough and that there is a better way, he locks them up. Sans wakes up back into the world and runs out to see magic attacks flying, spears and fire. It is Undyne and Toriel at a standstill. Undyne yells that the kid tried to stab Toriel, and that the kid and Papyrus are alone in Waterfall. With each step Sans makes, he teleports right past Toriel, rushing to Waterfall. Sans did not make it in time. Chara gloats in Sans's face with his failure to keep Papyrus safe, even when he is keeping some of his memories. Sans decides to do something different than just killing them talking so he can learn more about his enemy. But as Toriel approaches, the timeline will need to be reset. That means Chara needs to die, but not with his scarf on. This now begins part 5, with one of the most recognizable images in the community by Rock Bomber on Tumblr. The most disturbing version of Gaster appears before Geno Sands. And I will be real, I do not like this guy at all. You cannot trust him, telling Gino just to end it. It's better to not feel anything in the void along with Gaster, telling Gino he feels sorry for him. Gaster telling Gino that no one will remember him, just like how no one remembers Gaster. When you tell your last ally the truth, and he calls you a madman, Please tell me who is in a sadder predicament. Gaster wants Gino in the void so bad, he is trying to destroy the little bit of hope he has. This understandably makes Gino snap Sans back to the save screen. Gino says a phrase that he would only know if he was truly here in the save screen for a long time. He also says, that he has brought this same Sans from different times here and had this same conversation. Gino Sans explains that he just wants Sans's help to end all of this. Every new timeline, Gino would slightly change what he would tell Sans to see if that would help convince him to go with Gino's plan. Gino saying his plan and reasoning, the plan with Chara, ending the timeline forever, the best way to protect Papyrus is ending existence. Sans's reaction obviously says it all. Gino Sans needs Sans to just bring Chara to the save screen and nothing else. Sounds pretty simple. Gino Sans is basically begging Sans to go with this world ending plan. But before Sans can give a real answer, he wants to see Frisk and it looks like Gino Sans is okay with this request. A fierce argument ensues when Sans doesn't want to do Gino Sans' plan, because it ends all of existence. Gino does not want Frisk to have the power to reset any longer, but Sans says that he knows Frisk regrets their actions. Sans is able to talk Gino out of this fit of rage. They both reach an understanding of their goals and why they have them. San seemingly gives up on this, just wanting to forget everything. But Gino does not accept this answer, having Sans give up. He doesn't want to do this again. 
Gino begins to fizzle and bug out, causing Sans to lend out his hand to try and help Gino. But Gino grabs and yanks Sans's hand, saying that Sans needs to see what Gino has seen in order to agree with him. When you see every friend, every monster, live the same days over and over. When you see every situation repeat like a broken record. And when you see him die again and again, and you fall into despair, then you'll finally see it is our only way to stop this awful cycle. And you'll see for yourself why this timeline must end forever. Snapping lifetimes of memories into Sans's head to show Sans why Gino has his goal. Frisk yells out to Gino to stop all of this. Gino Sans claps back, asking why Frisk cares about what's happening to Sans, knowing that Frisk has killed him so many times, having Sans relive their worst resets. Gino says that there is no way Sans will be on Frisk's side with anything after this. When Sans comes to, he asks if that's all he has. Sans states that showing him some bad timelines was not going to help him destroy everyone he loved. Sans gives Gino two choices. Gino starts over, or do it Sans's way. Gino Sans doesn't like the cards Sans is giving, so Gino Sans snaps Sans back into the world. Sans once again wakes up and says it was just a nightmare. Part 6 begins with Flowey popping into the space where Gino Sans is, telling Gino he should have just gone with his plan, asking how many more resets for Gino's plan to work. Flowey telling Sans he enjoys watching Gino suffer, being trapped in the save screen before Flowey gets taken back into the newly reset world. As Sans and Papyrus walk through the woods to their posts, Sans fails to keep his troubles under wraps. Papyrus starts talking to Sans about this, but Sans bursts out in insane laughter, just howling. Sans then goes on to say word for word what Papyrus was about to say. His entire dialogue, this rightfully scared Papyrus, and it seems that all of those memories Gino gave Sans is catching up to him. When Sans comes to, he apologizes for his outburst. Sans says that he doesn't want to ruin everything for Papyrus. He would if he spoke to him about his problems. After Papyrus had a long talk with Sans, Papyrus says that he is happy to see Sans finally open up to him. Papyrus would have rather that happen before the creepy laughing though, but he was happy nonetheless. Papyrus' words made Sans realize something. So Sans takes Papyrus to the ruins doors and waits for Chara to pass them. Sans states that things are about to get crazy and to just trust him. Chara opens up the door, meeting the two Skelebros past the door. Sans decides to ask for a hug then grabbing Chara's wrist and yelling out to Gino. Gino takes this golden opportunity that Sans gave him, and everyone is teleported to the save screen. Part 7 of Aftertale begins. Gino Sans is upset that Sans had brought Papyrus into the save screen, and since Papyrus doesn't want to hear two Sanses argue with each other, he yells out to them to cut it out. Gino decides to lock in on getting Chara, wasting no time at all to set up a battle box to take Chara down and destroy the timeline for good. Gino makes his first move be an out of the ground bone attack. Sans and Chara dodge this attack, but they slam into a wall. Sans tells Chara that if they want to get out of the save screen, they shouldn't let go. As the fighting continues, Frisk gets Papyrus' attention. Frisk tells Papyrus to let them out of the bone cage that Gino trapped them in, and they will help stop this together. Gino Sans questions Sans between attacks, but Sans does not back down. 
Sans does manage to talk Gino Sans down from continuing his attacks, and Papyrus gives the final blow to have Gino give up a hug. And with that, the battle box disappears. A new chapter begins, and we get some more cover art. The Sanses proceed to try to explain things to Papyrus, even though he can't fully comprehend it. Sans decides to let Gino and Papyrus have some privacy, while he goes to speak with Frisk and Kara. Chara doesn't like this, of course. Sans finally says that he wants to hear Chara's story. But Chara laughs at this idea, and once again, drops a bombshell. After all, remember what you did to the other fallen children? Sans hoping that Papyrus didn't hear that, because Sans would hate for Papyrus to learn more about his past that he has been hiding this whole time. Chara proceeds to yell out the following, and how the only thing that stopped you from doing the same thing to Frisk was a promise to some stranger through a damn door. And this catches the attention of Gino and Papyrus. Chara states that they came to the mountain not to explore, not a dare, but for their life to end, but ended up having a whole life surrounded by monsters in the underground. I thought monsters were better in every way to humans. I was even convinced that monsters deserved the surface, and the humans should just, just die off. I tried to make it happen, and I failed. I only regained any consciousness once Frisk came here. My soul had managed to exist beyond my death somehow. It was fun, you know, traveling with Frisk, making friends with everyone. But things had changed since I was alive. My parents separated, and a tutu here, a pair of glasses there, and the evidence of six dead humans at the request of my father. Chara says that monsters were supposed to be above killing like humans did, so they decided they wanted to make monsters suffer. Sans stops Chara from continuing. Sans states he doesn't make the best decisions. He just wanted to give monsters papyrus a better chance to be free on the surface. In the end, Sans begs for it all just to end. Frisk butts in, stopping Chara from arguing about this idea, that there is no good coming from all of this. Chara states that this all started from Frisk, and Frisk doesn't deny this fact. The ability to reset time is a horrible thing to have. Having so much power over others, I stopped caring about how they feel, even though I cared about them. The desire to play with lives, to experience new outcomes, were too much. Having such a power caused Frisk to stop caring about those that they truly cared about, hurting people like Gino into irreversible suffering. Frisk knows that they deserve punishment for their actions. Frisk wants to fix everything by resetting and getting everyone to the surface and never using the button again. Chara brings up the idea of killing everyone in the save screen. Frisk quickly ruins that idea with the fact that no one can die here. Same with healing. Frisk also tells Chara that they would have to fight two Sanses that can't die, no healing, and no resets. The odds were not in Chara's favor. Chara would have to no-hit and somehow kill two entities that can't die. We all know only Murg is capable of doing this. Frisk tells Chara their plan, and Chara accepts this plan. Chara stating, You're going to make it worse, you know. The monsters think the surface is paradise. They won't be accepted by humanity. You're going to build up their hopes, just to crush them with how horrible reality can be before collapsing. Sans attempts to interact with Chara's soul, but Sans learns and tells Frisk that Chara's soul had disappeared. Gino states 
that Chara finally accepted that they were dead, resulting in them no longer possessing Frisk's body. For the finale of Aftertale, we get the other half of the last cover art. As the story's characters stare at the start of the end of their story, Frisk is about to go ahead and reset the timeline. Gino San says that he completely does not trust Frisk, saying he does not agree with this. Frisk lets Gino be aware that Frisk understands why he doesn't trust them, but to give them this one chance. The reset button is clicked. Frisk, Sans, and Papyrus are sent back into the world with a snap. Aftertale begins for the final time, as Frisk begins going through Undertale's story for the final time, as Gino watches. Hope is an interesting thing. Hope can be painful, and people will give up on hope and accept despair. Despair is a comfortable misery. You can't be let down when expecting the worst. A lack of hope is safe after all, but hope has a way of creeping up on you and eventually you start wanting to believe in hope once more. Gaster just had to appear once more. Gaster continues to stress an already dying Sans to death, reminding him that he is running out of time and telling Sans how his plan failed and that he is supporting his murderer. Everything he was staying alive for was for nothing, that he should just die already. There is no point in waiting any longer. But after seeing Frisk continue the ending of their journey, Gino Sands finally goes full throttle on the human's plan to save him. Gino Sands will root for the human as Gino Sands removes the glitches that he was hiding behind this entire time and finally fighting back against Gaster's suggestions and words. Gaster states that he was just trying to help him, but Gino knows that this must be untrue, since Gaster has been trying to make Gino come to the void with him. But Gino understands how being alone for so long can make someone crazy. He almost went crazy himself. Gaster finally gives up on getting Gino to join him in the void. Gaster saying that others will accept his proposals, and others will take the easy way out in the void, and Gaster finally makes his exit. And the crew returns for Gino, and Papyrus doesn't seem to like Gino's new haircut, but Papyrus quickly changes the subject back to saving Gino. Gino doesn't believe that he could survive outside of the save screen, but the human has an ace up their sleeve, a slice of butterscotch cinnamon pie. Since Gino was dying as he came into the save screen, Frisk has the idea for Gino to heal right when he exits the save screen. For a full heal on the HP he could heal up to, Gino isn't very fond of this idea, since it seems to be just too simple. Gino learns that Papyrus was the one to think of this plan, with the help of Frisk. Gino San says that even if this plan doesn't work, he will be grateful for how much they have tried to save him. And they all proceed to go through the screen. During the transition into the world, Gino uses the pie, and Gino has survived. 
feeling the sun on his bones, and a hug from Papyrus. Undyne runs from down the mountain and sees Gino Sands, and she has an understandable reaction, yelling at both Sands's. Papyrus introduces Gino to the group, and Alphys is shocked by the implications of such proof of other versions of monsters. Everyone begins down the mountain to go watch a movie, and Gino looks out at the sunset, ready for his new life on the surface. Because there is always tomorrow. I really hope you enjoyed this ending of Aftertale, and my narration and explaining of the story of Aftertale. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoy this Pass the Ox, but only for Undertale fan creations. And music, of course. This will be me, signing out. A Megalovania 9th Anniversary cover by the Surgeon Art. <laughs>